Christianity is not a religion of peace. I feel a very strong burden to do this study because there's a lot of people out there that call themselves Christians and they're not Christians. And they try to come out with this thing of being real passive and real, let's not offend anybody and whatever else. It's just supposed to be this nice little peaceful thing that just is syrupy and sappy and whatever else. That's not biblical Christianity. And this is the reason that we're losing this country here in America. And the reason that a lot of the countries over in Europe and other places are filled with a bunch of pagan heathen people that can't fight evil and can't stop evil. Because Christianity has lost its militancy. It's lost its power. The Bible warns about in the end times that there will be people, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. There's another passage of Scripture that talks about having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Power comes from fighting. Power does not come from pacifism. All right, let's make that very clear. And I'm going to show you from the Scriptures today what peace we have as Christians as Christians, and that the lost world does not have that peace. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39 says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Jesus Christ speaking in this passage. I came not to send peace, but a sword. You know what book has caused more death and more dying and destruction and more judgment and more narrow-minded bigotness, bigotness, bigotry and whatever else? You know what book has caused it? King James Bible. No book in history has caused as much bloodshed as this blessed book right here. That's right, I call it a blessed book. And all you wicked professing Christians out there that hate the King James Bible, your damnation is just. You deserve the hell that you're going to burn in for all of eternity. Oh, I don't believe in eternal hell. You're going to find out. You'll find out. It's your home. That's where you're headed and you deserve it. You so very much deserve it to reject this amazing book. How dare you reject it? Jesus didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. When you truly get saved, you'll find out that your family is fake and that they really truly hate your guts. You'll find that out very quickly. You'll have your grandmother that you thought was so kind and so dear and you'll realize that she's a satanic devil many times. Your parents will turn against you. Your siblings will hate your guts. They'll say, we don't want them around. If they're going to be there at the family get-together, then I'm not coming. I don't want that narrow-minded bigot coming there and trying to destroy our fun. That's true Christianity. Oh, my whole family, we're all saved and we all love the Lord. We all get along then you're probably a false convert along with all of them. Why? Because Jesus said he's going to set you against your family. Don't you get it? Do you believe this book or don't you? Verse 36, And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Unless it's in modern day America. I don't think so. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, I don't want to say anything because my children get offended and, and, I, and they'll keep the grandchildren from coming over. <laughs> then you're not worthy of Jesus Christ, according to Jesus Christ, according to his word. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. What does that mean? That means you have to fight. You have to be a warrior, a soldier for Jesus Christ, and you will lose your life. You get over there to a battlefield, speaking in real warfare terms, men that go to battlefields, a lot of times who they were, it dies on the battlefield. That innocent young man that went over there doesn't, doesn't know anything about killing, all of a sudden he's killed hundreds of times, many, quite often. He's seen his best friends blown up and they're laying there and dying and screaming and he's seen all kinds of horror and he comes back a changed man. Guess what, Christian? That's supposed to be you, spiritually speaking. When you truly get born again, when you truly get saved, it changes everything. And now all of a sudden, people that were once your friends are now your enemies. Division is what Jesus brings. Isaiah 57, go back to Isaiah chapter 57, 
Unless your feelings have already been hurt and you think that my tone is wrong and, and it's, I probably have been hurt in my past and whatever else, then just go shut the video off and go watch Joel Osteen, okay? Your best scam now. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 57, verse 19 through 21. Let's see what the Bible has to say here. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. You know what? There is a promise of peace to lost people. It's for healing. Healing from a life of sin. Do you understand? I'm going to give you peace and you can continue in your own rotten, sinful lifestyle. No, you can't. You cannot. If you need to be healed, if you need a doctor, the great physician will see you and he will tell you what to do. He'll save you and he'll change your life. And then you get peace. But before then, there is no peace. How do I know? Let's continue. Verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. They go out and they say, we'll have our peace conventions. We'll say peace and all this other stuff. They don't have any peace. And they don't deserve any peace either. Why would God grant peace to people that are living wickedly and in sin on this earth that he's created and their eternity is going to be burning forever? Why should there be peace for those people? So I know some lost people, they have a lot of peace. No, it's because they've seared their conscience. There's no peace there. They don't have true peace. That can only come through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 10, verse 36. Back to the New Testament again. Acts chapter 10, verse 36 and 37. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Peace through Jesus Christ. That's it. He is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached. And then it goes down through talking about how Jesus came. He offered peace through his cross. But you have to come as a sinner before you get it. There's no peace to the wicked. God doesn't give them peace. Peace comes through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul addressing, he's starting in the epistle here to the saints in Romans, in, excuse me, in Rome. Um, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, no, Paul, it should be grace in, to you know them and everything and peace to the saved and to the lost as well. Because we can all build church buildings together and fellowship together. The churched and the unchurched. And we all have peace. We all get along and, you know, welcome, welcome to church. Let me give you a hug. Oh, here's some coffee and donuts there, lost person. Let's come in and, and you can sit here and you can sing praises to God or whatever else with, you know, actually praises to them. But no. Peace only comes from being saved, being a saint of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I realize a lot of these uh, false converts out there that call themselves Christians, they're not familiar with what I'm doing. It's just, oh, you're, you're just using the Bible all the time. Yeah, that's what being a Christian is. Remember? Jesus came and he gave a sword. You remember that? Do you, do you remember that? Oh, probably not. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, verse 12 and 13. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. We can have peace. I have peace. My wife has peace. Other saved brethren that we meet, we have peace among ourselves. Why? Because we all know we're going to heaven when we die. And you see, the peace that comes upon us is not peace because we just love the world and we love life and everything. It, it's peace because of we understand where we're going, but it's peace in the midst of warfare. It's fighting. 
You can have peace because you know that no matter what I do as a Christian, if I'm serving the Lord and I'm standing for His Word, I will be rewarded one day. I will go to heaven when I die. The satanic counterfeit of Islam comes along and they say, if you die in holy jihad, then you'll go right to paradise. Where do you think they got that from? Their demented sex pervert founder, Muhammad, comes along and, he's, and he uh, brings this whole thing out. He stole it from the Bible. We're the ones that should be fighting holy wars. We're the ones that should be fighting against sin. And if we die, we go to heaven. But a bunch of stupid Muslims come along and they pervert that. And they take it. And then Christians just say, oh, well, they took it from us, so I guess we'll just let them have it. It's wickedness. Complete wickedness. 1 Peter chapter 5. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. This isn't a real ultra-detailed study or whatever on the subject of peace. I'm not intending it for that. It's an exhortation. But uh, that's why I'm going through some scriptures very quickly here. But we can do a lot deeper study. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And there are so many verses like this that I could show. Peace comes to us who are in Christ Jesus. It's not for the lost world. They're not supposed to have peace. Right? And quite frankly, we shouldn't be giving them peace. We should be trying to disturb them. We should be trying to upset them. But we forgot our calling, haven't we? Because, well, I could lose my job and I could lose my social standing and I could lose my, you know, whatever. We're so worried about being part of the world. Or rather, a lot of you are. I made my decision years ago to serve the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. A lot of you are still on the fence. Oh, you're speaking down to us. Yes, absolutely, I am. A lot of the Christians out there today are just not even worth shooting. And I mean the ones that are born again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There in, uh, down in, what was it, 13? Yeah, verse 13. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. That's for saved. What about the lost? Same chapter, verse 3. For when they shall say, peace and safety. Huh. They're saying peace and safety. Oh, we'll have peace and safety. We're going to have peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That's the future of lost people. And if you're lost watching this video right now, that's your future. Do you like that? Just when you think you got it all good, you got the right guy elected into office, you got the right laws and the right new ways and the right new technologies and everything else to make your life better and everything's going to be a wonderful, peaceful, new world order, your destruction hits at that point in time. The best that man can do with all of his technology and all of his education and everything else, the best that man can do is going to lead to destruction, absolute total destruction. Why are we as Christians okay with that? Why are we helping bring it in? By being silent. We're supposed to stand against it. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Did you forget that? We're supposed to hinder the Antichrist system. Revelation chapter 6. Show you another good one here. Another promise for the lost people. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4 says, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. That's coming. It's in the future. Oh, I think that uh, we should just kind of, you know, try to go out there and try to be peaceful with people and and let them know about Jesus' his love, you know. Um, no, we should let them know about the wrath of God that's coming. And the fact that they are de destined for a judgment in front of God. And that 
when that judgment hits, more than likely they're going to end up in hell. That's what we should let them know. Just a few points to make here before I close this little video. Um, point number one, it's we've gotten to such a point here in this world, it's such a whatever you want to call it, a time that now we have modern Christians that literally believe that being militant and divisive is a sin. <laughs> it's insane. I mean, I've had them say that about me. He's too militant. He's too divisive. Um, well, sowing discord among brethren is an abomination in God's sight, but division, Jesus came to bring division. You know, well, the King James only issue is divisive. Amen. Yes, it is. I thank the Lord that it's divisive. I wouldn't want to be part of it if it wasn't. There's a book right here. The new versions come out and they change this book. No, thank you. I'm dividing from you. Well, we accept all versions here. Okay, then go over that way. You accept versions that trace back to the Vatican. Study the manuscript evidence. That's where it goes. Vaticanus, Sinaiticus. The whole conspiracy. Yes, conspiracy. The Jesuits brought out the Dewey Reims version in 1610, one year before the King James Bible, the authorized version of 1611. There's a conspiracy there. The Latin Vulgate replaced by Jerome's Latin Vulgate back in 380 AD. It's been going on for centuries. You see? Oh, well, my pastor tells me that, you know, the new versions are actually a little bit more accurate than your pastor's a, a hellbound devil is what he is. Send the video to him. Tell him I told you that. All right? We're supposed to be militant. We're supposed to be divisive. And the devil came along. One of his master plans was coming along and bringing these church buildings because the church buildings, you get in there, perfect trap. You First of all, it's a pagan building, so God can't bless it. God never told anybody to go to church in his word. But then you get in there. Now there's a mortgage. Now there's debt. So you have to kind of tone down the preaching a little bit. And then you go and you say, hey, how are we going to do our taxes here? Let's go to the government. Yeah, there's a good idea. Let's go to the secular government and get article, put our church under Article Section 501c3. So now we're tax exempt. Oh, that's right. But we just can't do anything to say anything about elections. Do you ever get around election time? You go into one of these Babel buildings, these church buildings, and they say, I can't tell you who to vote for. Could you give me some scripture on that, please? Where's the scripture that says, I can't tell you who to vote for? Then you go there for a marriage and it says, now by the power invested in me by the state of whatever, I pronounce you man and wife. Power invested in you by the state? That's right. It's a federal building under the federal government. Oh, that's, that's godly. Yeah. Devil comes along and says, let's build church buildings. Let's get them all over the country. And you know something? There's more church buildings now than there were 200 years ago. Obviously, right? But what's the moral condition like? Hey, America, how's the morality going? Oh, that's right. It's in the toilet. You have people walking around. They don't even know if they're a man or a woman for crying out loud. What's the church doing to stop it? What are all the new, easier to understand Bible versions doing to stop it? Not one thing. Why? Because it was never of God. That's why. Second point I want to make. Our rewards in heaven are based upon our suffering for Jesus Christ here on this earth. Well, let's go to church and let's talk about fishing and let's talk about hunting and let's talk about the weather and let's talk about politics and whatever. Are you suffering? Well, you know, yes, we, for a while we had, we had bad carpet till we put new carpet in. Oh, uh, <laughs> wow, boy, really tortured for the Lord, aren't you? Bunch of sissies hiding in your little church building. Oh, you hide behind a camera. I put my face out there. Name's Brian Denlinger. Put it out there for the whole world to see. Try it with your church building. Oh, that's right. You don't want to do that. Oh, there's certain things I don't know if I'd want coming out publicly. Coward. <laughs> the Bible does say in numerous places, we didn't go to those different references, but the Bible says we're to be live peaceably with all men. What is that talking about? That's talking about physical. Okay. We're not supposed to go out and wage warfare like the papists have done down through the centuries with their crusades. We don't go and force people at the edge of the sword or at the edge of a gun or the point, at the end of a gun and say, convert or die. That's all that it's talking about. That's the peace that we're supposed to have between us and the lost world. It's physical peace. I live at peace with my neighbors in the sense of 
Um, I'm not going to go kick their door in and try to, you know, cram the Bible in their face or something. I don't do that. But I don't live with them, with, with them uh, peacefully in the terms of spiritual peace. I put signs out that irritate them. I want to see bars shut down. More on that in just a minute. I want to see things happen. I want to push righteous standards upon the people of this area. I'm at war with them spiritually. I'm not interested in spiritual peace with my lost neighbors. Another point to make, the devil's not never stopped fighting. So why are you? Why are you looking for some special election candidate that you can get in the office and then we'll have peace or something like this with the lost world? It's never going to happen. Don't you know what the Bible says? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Perilous times shall come. The beginning of sorrows, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence. That's the end times. Do you believe the Bible? They aren't going to stop fighting. There's no uh, middle ground. Hey, you know, the devils will leave me alone if I just do this. I don't mess with them and they don't mess with me. That's not true. They will try to destroy you. You know, Martin Luther, all the issues that the guy had, his hymn that he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. That's the whole thing. They want to undo us. They are coming after us. We have to go back after them. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, I don't know if I should resist. Just kind of ignore. It doesn't happen. He's coming after you. You have to fight. You have no choice. Another point that I'd like to make before I get into some solutions here. Uh, if you're worried about losing your job because of your stand or something like that, let me give you some real good advice. Get out of debt. Uh, another one of Satan's masterful tactics has been to put Christians into debt. Well, Brother Brian, I know what you're saying, but I could lose my job. Oh, I could lose, you know, I have bills to pay and I just... It, when did Christians start getting into debt? When did we start acting like the lost world and going out and saying, I covet that bigger house, I covet that newer vehicle, I covet this and I covet that? Beware of covetousness. Huh. And all of a sudden we go out and we're coveting things that we don't really need, and then we get into debt because we're acting like little spoiled brats. They can't wait to God till God gives you the money. And then you get yourself buried into debt and then you start to worry about your stands that you have to take and I shouldn't I just have to back down and I back down and just back away from the enemy you better get out of debt if you're so worried about losing your job and all the money and everything else all right how can we fight I'm going to give you some real solutions here did a sermon a long time ago a year or two ago whatever uh, about uh, a call to fight watch that study but uh, I'm going to give you 10 things here that you can do to fight. All right? We need to start doing as Christians. Number one, prayer and fasting. We need to be praying about things and fighting against things. All right? And I don't just mean, I pray for people to get saved and I pray and you know whatever else. Uh, you can pray for certain people to get saved, but you know what? There's a lot of evil people out there that are standing in the way of others getting saved. And, and let me just, let me be real real blunt about something here you know what america needs more than anything else you say jesus america needs jesus um no america is actually filled to the top with all kinds of jesus's okay there are any flavor of jesus that you want there's a jesus out there to satisfy it right i don't like this jewish jesus well then make him a white jesus well i don't like the white jesus either so make him a black jesus well i don't like a jesus that's offensive well then make him inclusive make him about peace and and you know for everybody uh no america doesn't need to hear more about this guy named jesus all right what america needs is they need death what yes america needs death because then people start to think about i want the truth I'm seeing people dying all around me. Give me the truth. I'm not interested in fake Jesuses or whatever else. I want to know the truth here. I'm getting scared. And then you can give them the real, true word of God, the King James Bible. 
and give them the real true Jesus Christ and the real true gospel, not the Gnostic gospel of the modern satanic church movement that says only believe, that's all it takes. There's no repentance of sin. There's no calling upon the Lord. Prayer and fasting. Number two, King James only divisiveness. That's how we need to fight. This is your sword. I came not to bring peace, but rather division. I'm giving you a sword, the Lord says. And the devil comes along and he says, I need to disarm you. I need to take away your sword. Here, I'll give you this other Vatican version. I'll give you this other new version here or whatever else. And we'll give you, you can carry around six different Bibles and prefer whichever one you want for certain verses, you know, or then go to Greek and Hebrew. And then you, no, we're supposed to have a sword, an offensive weapon. So King James onlyism is divisive. That is exactly correct. That's what I want. I want to be part of it. Let me divide and get away from the lost people out there. Oh, you use your new versions and you, you know, hate the King James Bible? Get away from me. We're not part of the same army. Go away. I mean, you really want to go into, into battle? There you're walking into battle and you all have your swords and you look like this and you look at the guy beside you and he's got a little lightsaber, you know, and this guy over here, he's got a plastic sword. You want to fight side by side with those people? Well, if you want to, then count me out. Number three, gospel signs and tracting. Well, yes, brother, but I, I actually had guys, you know, Baptists tell me the one time that they didn't want to put magnets on their vehicles because it would ruin the paint on their car. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. You know, uh, the Lord, yeah, the Lord doesn't want you to ruin the paint on your vehicle. Why can't you just put a bunch of bumper magnets on your vehicle? You know what? I'll tell you one thing because I've done it for so many years now. Um, it discourages tailgating. You put the gospel on the back of your vehicle, people will purposefully drive way back. They don't want to be up in there. Or, you'll, you know, they'll tell you that you're number one with their middle finger. You know, so, hey, I agree with that. Thank you. Jesus Christ is number one. You know, praise the Lord. But, uh... Get militant with your vehicle. Why not? Well, I'm a little bit ashamed. Of... Then get over it. It's time to fight. Put it on your vehicle. Put some bumper magnets on, some bumper stickers. Oh, even worse. Oh, that's just terrible to put a sticker on there. Oh, no. It would just ruin the value of my vehicle. Oh, you mean the thing that the bank owns that you're making payments on? Oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> um, tracting. Get some gospel tracks. Put those out. You say, there aren't any that are any good. Okay, then make your own. Well, I'll just sit here and I'll just watch videos and I'll just have Brother Brian do everything for me and I'll just sit here and, and when are you coming out with gospel tracks, brother? You come out with your own. Why do I have to do everything? <laughs> you know, well, I sent you a donation once, so that means you should be you know, doing videos, writing books, making gospel tracts, making gospel signs, uh, you know, having a Christian camp to go to. And uh, 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 No, God calls you to do things. One of you should start a, a tract company. Bible-believing tracts or something like that. That would be wonderful. Don't ask me for my advice. I don't have any. <laughs> okay, I apologize for that. I had a battery go dead on me. It's uh, pretty cold out here right now, probably about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Number four thing we can do to fight, greater independence and nonconformity. If you're so dependent on the lost world for your very existence, well then it's no wonder you don't want to offend them. You have to become a nonconformist. You have to become independent of the system. If you didn't learn anything through the pandemic, you should have learned that there are places that you shouldn't go. They can impose restrictions and things that go against the scriptures and against common sense. And if you are so dependent upon them, then you'll be tempted to conform to them. You have to become independent and self-sufficient. It's very important and a nonconformist. We don't conform to the lost world. Point number five, clearly define gender roles and speech. Very important. All the, the perverts out there they want to continually dress uh, more men more wickedly. 
They want to come out and do transgender and all this other wicked, abominable stuff, things that destroy nations, and we're just supposed to be okay with that. No, we're supposed to speak against it. And quite frankly, you don't even really have to speak against it. All you have to do is just go out and, and wear men look like men. All right, if you can grow a beard, it's a good thing. Wonderful. You don't have to. There's no scripture saying you have to grow a beard, whatever. But look manly. Act manly. Ladies, look and act like a lady. Don't try to look and act like a man. Don't wear your husband's pants or have your hair cut like your husband. All right? Long, beautiful hair. Long, beautiful, modest dresses. And use your speech. Say, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, well, I don't prefer that as a, whatever. Ma'am, uh, that man over there is doing this, or this that woman, I saw some man trying to walk into the women's bathroom or whatever else. Well, he's identifying as a woman today. No, he's a pervert. He's disgusting. That's the way it should be. It doesn't take anything for a, a lady to dress in a dress, a beautiful dress, when you go out in public someplace, be a witness for Jesus Christ. Number six, don't vote for the lesser of two evils. Uh, that's been another thing that has destroyed our nation. Well, you know, Hillary and Trump, who should we vote for? Well, let's go with Trump because he's not quite as evil as Hillary. Oh, let's go with, uh, you know, Trump again. Uh, old Joe Biden, they, they gave him the election. If you even believe in the whole election process, you're very foolish. They put in whoever they want. Your vote doesn't mean anything anyhow. So what are you doing supporting the lesser of two evils? And I'm going to tell you right now, all you idiots out there that said, I thank God for President Trump and everything else. He's a script reader. He's an actor. Don't you get it? The guy's got the, the morals of an alley cat. And some of you stupid Baptists out there, you actually defend him. And you're trying to get him back in again. What's wrong with you people? Idiots. <laughs> Number seven. Another, another thing we can do to fight, target evil establishments. Hey, there's a bar. Go street preach outside of it. Go put tracks on the windshields. Even take a little gospel coin, little metal gospel coin or whatever else, and just go put that at the entryway. Do something. Pray against it. Stop it. You know, our time here in the area of Maine where we're at, we've seen a bar shut down. And then they reopened it, and it shut down again. You know why? Because we were putting gospel coins out there. And we were praying against it. And guess what? Another wicked establishment is currently shutting down. And we pray that it shuts down. We pray that it doesn't open up again. The wicked people that want to come and mine in this area, want to bring, bring a bunch of uh, out-of-state drunken slobs here, miners, to go around and mess up the area more. We're praying against them. We're fighting against them. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be a militant fighting army. That's what we're supposed to be. Number eight, sing praises to God. How often do you sing praises to God? And you know what? Let's really make it militant. Uh, the Bible talks about singing praises to God before the heathen. Wouldn't that be something? Start singing a praise to God in the midst of a store with rock music going. Start to whistle a hymn or hum a hymn or something like that. Wouldn't that be something? Let's get more militant. Number nine, purify your life and home of sin. Well, you know, I, I have some movies around that maybe aren't exactly perfect and whatever, but, uh, you know, they were given to me as gifts years ago back when I was lost, and I just I don't have the heart to get rid of them. I mean, they, they have a few profane words. In it. What are you doing with that stuff? Well, there's still some music and things in my home that is, you know, a little bit wicked, but yeah, yeah. get rid of it. Pur purify your life and home of sin. Be a soldier for Jesus Christ. And number 10, exhort one another. That's another very important thing to do challenge one another. Let's raise the standards higher. Let's not bring them down. Let's say, hey, brother, I just wanted to say this. I saw your video and I, you know, agree with you, but you know, you had that worldly shirt on whatever. I had a Ruger t-shirt on the one time and some brethren said, you know, you really shouldn't do that. That's sort of a Phoenix design with the bird. It's in flames and whatever else and you really shouldn't wear it. I stopped wearing it. 
That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Let's challenge each other, provoke one another to righteousness. That's what we're supposed to do. So short little study here, but uh, I do pray it has been a blessing to you and a challenge more than anything. Um, we're not going to get along with people. Uh, the lost world, we're a savor of death to them, the Bible says. Uh, we're not supposed to have them look at us and say, I really respect those people. Uh, no, they should want to stay away from us. Okay, the, when the, uh, not Aquila and Priscilla, um, Ananias and Sapphira, when they dropped dead in the book of Acts, the people, uh, they magnified the Christians, but no man durst join himself to them. Uh, you know why politicians act like they're Christians? You know why? You know why Donald Trump, you know, posed with an RSV? <laughs> it's out in front of some big Bible building. You know, and people went, praise the Lord, he's a Christian, he held up a Bible. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know why they do that? Because they fear those of us that actually understand the King James Bible. They know that we are an army, that if we rise up, they can't stop us. They know that. The Jesuits understand how dangerous this King James Bible is. That's why they want to take it away from you. They have no chance fighting against us if we rise up against them. So with the time that you have left, whatever you did in 2022, it's a new year. The time that you have left, get militant. Fight for Jesus Christ. Don't be a pacifistic coward. That is going to be it. Get something done for the Lord this week. Today, do something for the Lord. Do something. Stand out and step out boldly in faith and go do something for the Lord Jesus Christ.